Sure, what the heck? Oh, oh my gosh, Absolutely, why not? Let's see if it does. I really should have just plugged one up because now I gotta get out of it. <laughs> we wanted to know how professionals have changed over time. So we got different experts from multiple decades to share their experiences. We took off from JFK and there was a huge explosion. We were like, what? The whole plane is rattling like this. The engine had exploded and all the blades, they looked like Venetian blinds, their blades inside the engine, they shot out into the plane. I could look at them and they were embedded in the aircraft because we could look out the window and we could see this. The whole plane is shaking. So we have instructions from the captain to do a planned emergency evacuation. We had a list, uh, a plastic card with all the instructions that we had to do. We had to collect eyeglasses and heels so that they didn't go down the slide with them. We had to uh, get two able-bodied men for each door in case we died and we weren't able to open the exit. I had to teach you how to do it. So I started to lose it. I started to cry and I started to get crazy. And then I saw my girlfriend, Judy. She was little Susie Stewardess, you know, she was doing everything she was supposed to. She was all calm and I said, you know what? If she could do it, I could do it. And if I have to die, I don't want to go like an idiot. I want to have some dignity. So I pulled myself together. This is what you really think of when you're going to die. You pull yourself together and you say, I don't want to go out like that. And we all got everybody ready for landing to crash land in New York. We had to dump all the fuel over the Atlantic. We came back to JFK. Of course, none of this was in the news because the airlines used to squash any negative press. Not like today, it's on TikTok every five minutes. So we landed and we landed perfectly safe. And we all walked off the airplane, but we were like, we were like this. You know, we weren't right. <laughs> they were the flight attendants, and I never know if they're like actually freaked out or if they're calm. We're not allowed to. I mean, we don't show you anything. Don't ever look at their faces to get a clue because they're never gonna give it. They're gonna be like this. We're trained to be prepared and not to react. Fire on an airplane is the worst thing. You never want to have to deal with a fire on the aircraft. I would say probably the scariest moment I had was there was a fire on board. We had taken off and all of a sudden, probably about 20 minutes, 15 minutes into the flight, you could smell smoke in the air. We have incredible training. Our emergency training is amazing. So you just kind of go into a different mode. And I went up and asked the purser, Jay, I said, Jay, what's going on? He goes, Carol, there's a fire in the cockpit. And all of a sudden you think, wow, a fire in the cockpit is not something that we hear about a lot. I went back and I got him the um, fire extinguisher behind the last row of seats in first class. Just as I had gotten up there, the extinguisher in my hand, the door opened up and the cockpit said, we need another extinguisher. And I could see uh, like a semblance of a flame because I was eerily calm. And I handed them the extinguisher, closed the door. I said to Jay, I said, um, okay. And now I said, okay, he knows me. So I go, no, I'm going to pray. <laughs> and at that point in time, we got a call back from the cockpit, the fire was out. So we needed at that point to get the plane ready to emergency land. We ended up landing safely, thank goodness. And at that point in time, we could see the runway. There, it seemed like hundreds of, of fire, fire inches, but maybe there was 10 or 15, 20 that, of that was surrounding the airplane. The fire chief put a ladder up to the forward door and came up there and he took one look in the cockpit and he said, holy, mm, um, how did you survive this? Because at that point, it looked like a bomb had gone off in the cockpit. Our pilots were amazing. I think um, our crew responded so beautifully. And that's where I want passengers to know that the importance of our training and what we can accomplish is so important. You definitely check your faith real quick, you know, and I'm like, oh, please, God, you know, get me out of this. I'll never fly again. I'll never fly again. And tomorrow I'm like, oh, wait, I'm going to check in at eight in the morning. You know, it's the same thing as like when you get too drunk one night, you're like, I'll never drink again next week. And you're like, come on, guys, let's go out. <laughs> I think it was $500 a month. We had to go in and get our paycheck from the airport. You know, there was no computers. There was no, um, you know, instant paycheck. We had to get dressed up to go to the airport, business attire, get our paycheck, and then go in person, drive to a bank and deposit it. So it was a whole big production on our days off. You got your base salary 
and then you got um, per diem. And then you also received maybe overtime pay if you flew over X amount of hours. It wasn't the best rate of pay. We all had to live together, especially in a city, high cost of living city like a New York or a London. But, you know, we two or three people would live together in an apartment. And because we were always traveling, you didn't always see your roommate. You know, you might just see them once a month, depending on your flight schedule. Probably about... You know, 2000 a month, I think back in the 90s. When, when I started, I, I believe it was $18 an hour or so. It was, it was low. Really, you can't really survive on it, you know, but I was living still with my parents when I started. I started, I was 22 years old. In the 60s, in the 70s, and the 80s, there were a lot of hijackings. We learned down in training uh, what to do in case of a hijacking, and that was always a fear, and everyone seemed to be going to Cuba. My friend um, Jeannie was hijacked to Cuba, a DC-10. She was the purser on that flight, and um, it was a very, very scary. She was uh, flying from New York to St. Croix and St. Croix back. And there was a man who had murdered several people, was being escorted by um, three air marshals. In those days, you were allowed to be uncuffed, and you're allowed to walk around the airplane. He went to the bathroom several times. He was looking for a gun that had been planted in the bathroom. And so he kept going back and forth to the, to the bathroom. And the flight attendants noticed everything. Come to find out, he found the gun, and he disabled the air marshals and had them on the ground. And then he demanded to be sent to Cuba. <sighs> In those days, we were taught to cooperate. You know, we were, uh, we were told to talk to the hijackers about their family, about our family, to make ourselves be a human being to them. She had a gun pointed to her temple for the entire flight from St. Croix to Cuba. But they weren't sure if they didn't have enough fuel to land in Cuba, but they did. And Fidel Castro was in a good mood that night, and he invited the, uh, he took the hijacker off the airplane, and he's still walking free today, that hijacker. But um, they were nice to the crew when they landed, and they let them come out and have a bite to eat and um, uh, <laughs> buy things in the gift shop. And uh, they were allowed to get fueled up and come home. And uh, Jeannie ended up getting one of the highest awards the, the U.S. government ever gave for her exemplary work that night and, and keeping him calm and that nobody died. 9-11 was different because we tried to uh, make ourselves appear more human to them. but. Um, on 9-11, you know, we thought we were going to land someplace, but we didn't, they, we never dreamed they'd be crashing the plane into a building. It is a hard picture to see. Um, it is the clipper made of the seas that was bombed over Lockerbie, Scotland in 1988. You know, through the investigation after the fact, it was discovered that a bomb had been planted in luggage that somehow made it through Frankfurt on a connecting flight through London to New York. There was a Libyan gentleman who was arrested and put in prison for the bombing of Pan Am 103. There's a lot of different stories and depending on who you listen to as to whether they were conspirators or Qaddafi, if he was behind the bombing in retaliation to a bombing of a, a Libyan site. You know, the, I think for us, um, the investigation obviously is important, and especially for the families, because they need to hold people accountable and responsible. Um, they're suffering still today. I was working at the flight service office at the time, and when the phone rang, and it was operations calling to tell us that the 103 was off radar. If there's an airplane off radar, that only means one or two things. There was either mechanical issues or something terrible happened. And sadly, something horrible had happened. I went over to the airport. A lot of the uh, people were arriving to meet what should have been the inbound aircraft from London. And that included the parents of a lot of the Syracuse students that were coming back from their semester abroad. I distinctly remember, and will, it will stay with me to my last day, the mother of one of the students who was there at the podium, she fell to the floor and let out a blood-curdling scream that only a parent could really understand the depths of her despair at that point. It was horrific. Uh, it's one of the darkest days in the airline's history. And it was only a few short years later that Pan Am went out of business. People weren't flying Pan Am anymore. 
they we were recognized as the subject of terrorism and people were scared to fly. The State Department, a lot of different government agencies were putting alerts out not to fly Pan Am. 747s were going out basically empty, maybe 15, 20 people on a plane. And unfortunately, this is the um, picture that is used so often on the anniversary of, of the flight. And it just brings back those that gut feeling, that sadness in you, um, knowing that this was the end of something great. <laughs> After Lockerbie happened, it was kind of the writing was on the wall that I didn't think that Pan Am was going to be able to survive. I think after this happened, I think it was really difficult for Pan Am to restructure because at that point, we were, you know, we were really financially in, in difficulty. And so I think we had just gotten an opportunity to kind of re-emerge. We were told that um, Delta was going to come in and get some financial backing. And so apparently, for whatever reason, they pulled out at the end. And so that's when the hopes were dashed. And I think Lockerbie, obviously, Lockerbie had a huge part in that, obviously, maybe in that decision. But I'm always an optimist. I've always been an optimist since I was a little kid. So, you know, that optimistic part in me was going to be like, I mean, I stayed with him till the very end. I'll never forget December 4th, 1991. I was flying back from Mexico City and I'd had the most amazing layover. I was flying with a great crew. We'd gone to the pyramids. We had this wonderful Mexican fiesta the night before. And we landed in um, JFK and cleaners came on board and said, uh, Pan Am ceased to operate. And that was probably one of the hardest moments. I think the whole crew, we all just started crying. And I think anytime when someone comes on and says, you know, your company that you love has ceased to operate, it's a huge, huge shock to you. Uh, there was a lot of flight attendants that got stuck in, in I mean, different places. And it was just trying to get these people back and trying to get them on airlines that could take them back. So the whole, the whole, everything was just put into this giant, you know, uproar where all of a sudden, what do I do with these tickets? You know, who's gonna honor them? I've just lost all this money, my vacations, everything. And so to me, it's, it's always had, you know, uncomfortable taste in my mouth, you know, experiencing that situation. The beginning of the 90s, I'm grateful that once I was able to get on with United, um, I was fortunate they took us on. They had taken on the Pacific routes a number of years ago that they had bought from Pan Am. So I had friends that I had flown with many, many years ago flying for United. There was a lot of things that were synonymous with the incredible company, corporation that was Pan Am that went up for sale. We had to sell the Pan Am building in Manhattan and then ultimately culminating in the sale of the Pacific to United in 1986, which was really the heart and soul of the airline. The airline that brings you 10 countries across Asia and the Pacific now bridges the Atlantic to Europe. Come fly the airline that spans more than half the world. United. I think that that was kind of a, a shock that they, uh, you know, had bought the routes from, from Pan Am. Um, I guess you always thought of Pan Am as flying all over the world at the time. And so I think sharing our route structure was, or, you know, giving away part of our route structure, not even actually, they bought our route structure, um, was surprising. It benefited um, United, which turned out to be, you know, a wonderful thing for me later on in my career. I think that at times Pan Am was looking to sell different things and different routes and depending upon the situation of the airline at the time. And, and sometimes you just need to make a little extra money. And so maybe they felt that it was a good investment to share to um you know sell off part of our route structure it was one of my hardest times in the 90s i think was realizing that a career that i loved all of a sudden stopped but i have to say that these are probably some of the best years of my life was flying for pan am september 11th was on a tuesday and i came in the day before from uh, portugal and i turned on the television and i watched the second plane hit live um, that was definitely uh, a, a crazy day. I was with Continental at that time. Continental and United had not merged. Um, we came to find out that no Continental airplane was used that day for the, uh, for the attacks, um, but United's airplanes were. And they had said that a small plane had hit the World Trade Center. It was red, white, and blue, which alarmed me, and then it came out that it was Flight 11 from Boston. 
and my friend Diane Bullis was on that plane, Diane Snyder, and the, the hijackers were in first class. My friends had Mohammed Atta on the flight the previous summer, before 9-11, in, in July and August, going back and forth to San Francisco. He was looking at taking flight 59, and he wouldn't eat or drink anything, and he would only deal with the male flight attendants. He would not deal with the female flight attendants, and he was as cold as ice. So they got this really weird vibe from him, and they all remembered him. But on 9-11 that day, when the second plane hit, and I saw that on TV, I knew, as everybody did, that it was terrorism. And um, it was horrendous. Airspace closed down on Tuesday. And Friday was the first day that um, that airspace was open. I was doing a flight that Friday um, from Newark to Sao Paulo, Brazil. And, you know, we don't profile um, anybody on an airplane, but <laughs> that day everybody was profiling everybody. It was just a scary time period, you know? Everybody's like, who are you, you know? What are you doing here? We hadn't met the pilot yet. And I went to the cockpit to introduce myself and he's sitting with the crash ax on top of the, uh, the instruments. And when I saw that, I was just like, whoa, this is rough. Right after September 11th, it was kind of like, it was kind of like like the COVID thing now. There was nobody flying. Nobody flew after September 11th. Like, it was, <laughs> planes were empty. Um, people just didn't want to fly. Everybody was scared. They started bringing in self-defense training, and, you know, how to how to defend ourselves, how to, how to block properly, what to use on, on an aircraft, things that we can use. Um, it was, it was a different, a different uh, culture, different lifestyle. Did you think it was less enjoyable to fly after 9-11? Yeah, a lot, a lot less enjoyable. How, why is that? Well, just everybody was on edge. In the old days, we wouldn't go through security. There was no security. I remember, I would leave my house in Long Beach at 8.30 for a nine o'clock flight. I would park in the pay lot and run to the gate and, and just sign in and just go to the airplane. You couldn't have to do that now. Oh, security was very different. Passengers, your family could go with you. You could take people through security. They could, you know, wave and see you off at the gate. Now everybody's gotta take off their shoes. We gotta understand, once that flight takes off, that's it. You know, it's, there's no, you, you're not turning around for, oh, I forgot this, or you gotta get that, or you gotta make sure everything is good. And that security is part of everything being good. Okay, this is graduation day in 1976, June 24th, and that's me right here. And that was a Bill Blass uniform. He was a designer, a very famous designer in the 70s, Bill Blass. All the airlines had designer uniforms. Every airline competed to have the best uniforms, and ours was Bill Blass, and I loved it. We had blue vests and we had red vests, uh, and we always had to have our wings on. So with this, because we were flying to the Caribbean, we were allowed to uh, not have the jacket on because it, it was so hot in the Caribbean. This is still the Bill Blast scarf that I was so proud to wear and we had to wear three inch heels. I, t I have a pair of the pants that I graduated with in and they're swimming on me because this is, this is how long the pants drag on the floor because of the heels. We had to, we had to wear three inch heels. So I, I didn't really have a problem wearing high heels when I was 21. Now, uh, it's, uh, now I wear sketches. <laughs> this is the um, Edith Head uniform, and you can tell by the cloche hat and the scarf at the neck. And this was actually the first uniform that I wore when I was hired from Pan Am. Edith Head was a famous fashion designer, Academy Award winning fashion designer. And um, Pan Am d was fortunate to be able to hire uh, several well-known Academy Award fashion designers to design Pan Am uniforms, which were considered very classic. The cloche hat was a really a symbol of Pan Am at the time and used frequently in Pan Am promotions. Well, this picture was clearly taken in after 1980 when Pan Am introduced a new uniform. Um, I wore this uniform, which is the Adolfo uniform uh, created by the designer Adolfo. And it was a great, very business oriented style uniform, as you can see with the Navy. And we all really loved and felt proud wearing it. We can't really tell me now, but that's the jacket I have on now. It's, it's actually retained the same jacket, the same style as the 2020s. And so um, the thing different in this picture is it's a blouse and 
the colors where it had mauve with the, um, the navy in it. But I have the wings here from the 90s, um, my original wings that I was pinned on. Do you know who designed that uniform? I don't. <laughs> you could walk through a terminal back in the 80s and all of a sudden people are like, oh my gosh, you know, look at that uniform. Or, you know, you think, okay, Edith Head designed that or Adolfo designed that. And so it was just, I think there's more an emphasis on, on uniforms back in the 80s. Uh, standard, you know, we had the uh, same type of shirt I'm wearing now with the epaulets and um, the, the standard wings. He's wearing a white serving garment. Yeah, he looked like a bartender. That's what we looked like uh, in first class. Do you remember who designed that? This one, I don't think we, we weren't into designers. I don't remember. I don't recall. I think it was in 2004. 16 we got the most beautiful gray uniforms and we had this red Cole Haan purse everybody looked fabulous in this uniform until people you know Facebook was around then people started writing that their heart was racing that they had rashes all over their bodies uh, one person had to go to the emergency room they thought they were having a heart attack and these are young flight attendants that are all of a sudden having all these things and it was affecting pets you know if you had your uniform in the garage and you had your cat there or, Cat, pets were dying when they were being exposed to these uniforms. And it wasn't until the cockpit really raised a big question, because they had poison shirts as well, uh, they said um, that we have an issue, that this I have a serious issue in the cockpit and this has to be dealt with. And then I went to a, um, a meeting uh, with American Airlines, uh, it was I think a shareholders meeting, and I brought a poster board of all the injuries of all the flight attendants with their pictures, and I spoke to Doug Parker, and I said, these are your flight attendants, these are your people. I said, they're getting very sick, some of them have died. I said, you need to take care of your people. And three days later, he pulled the uniform, the Twin Hill uniform, and so we don't have that contract anymore. He canceled that contract. So I guess I made a difference. Do you know what was causing it? Formaldehyde, uh, cadmium, uh, all sorts of crazy uh, uh, things that shouldn't be in a cloth because they weren't, um, I think it's called OTEX, they weren't approved. You know how the United States has rules and regulations on, on, on uh, fabrics that they make in the United States? But if you buy from Bangladesh and all these other countries that don't have that because they're cheaper, uh, your health is being affected. They don't have the same standards. <laughs> The day before 9-11, we ratified a contract where we got a huge raise and we had to give it back. And we gave it back gladly because we didn't want the airline to go under. Airlines were going under and we didn't want American to go under. The discount airlines came, I mean uh, JetBlue came, Spirit came, Frontier came, uh, and the legacy airlines. We couldn't compete with these low cost carriers because they were no frills. And so we had to slowly start cutting amenities. You know, the magazines went, the pillows went, the blankets went, but people still expected the high service because they knew about Americans' high service. And then after 9-11, you didn't get food. And then we brought back sandwiches. And let's say for a full plane, they gave me 25 sandwiches. And these poor people, you know, I didn't have enough food for people. I mean, people would start crying. The reason Pan Am probably ultimately had to fold was the fact that it didn't have a domestic route system. Every time Pan Am made an application to what at that time was the CAB um, for approvals, it was denied. Uh, we had fallen out of favor with the government. But while American carriers, like American, like United, like Northwest, were granted international route authority, so they were in direct competition with us, we didn't have the ability then to develop the domestic route structure to feed our international flights. There was also entering into the market a very different focus of onboard service. And it was moving away from the business model that Pan Am had prized for so many, for decades, and that being a real premium service. Now people were putting at the forefront of their ticket purchases price. It was more of an economy, economy class driven carrier that were offering, you know, low, cheap flights. I think the low cost carriers definitely created more of a price war for the tickets because they were offering sometimes lesser prices on certain routes. So we had to become more competitive. But I think bottom line though, passengers wanted to, you know, the passengers who fly a lot, there's certain things that they're willing to pay for and certain, you know, things that they're willing to 
maybe have more reliability in a company that's been around for a long time. And some of these low cost carriers were just popping up. So some of them would last, you know, a short time, some of them would last a few years, and some have grown into big carriers. We saw them come and go in the 90s. In 2010 was the merge on paper. It's bittersweet, you know? It's bittersweet for me. Um, How so? Well, I'm an ex-con, you know? Ex-continental. That's, uh, that's our ongoing joke when we, when we tell people, you know, I'm an ex-con. They're like, what? So that meant that they were not united. They were ex-cons. Did you like roll your eyes? You're like, oh, this joke again. Like, I know. It's like so silly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Continental was the best company ever to work for. The best. I, uh, from our CEO. Yeah, this is this man right here. I call him Gordy. Gordo. You know, his, his name is Gordon Bethune. This man took Continental Airlines from worst to first. He, uh... Literally, in one year, he took, the company was at the bottom position, and he took it to number one airline in the United States. Um, he's, and he knows exactly how to run an airline. But I, I, I'll never forget one day, I'm, I'm, in, um, I'm in Newark Airport, and I'm going on a flight, and I see him on his cell phone, and I just wanted to, like, catch his attention, just to say hello, acknowledge him, right? And I see him, and I give him, a, a, like, a hey, and he tells the person on the phone, hey, I'll call you back. And he hangs up and he looks at my ID and he's like, hey, uh, Carlos, where are you going? And I'm like, I'm going to Lisbon, Portugal. He's like, oh yeah, you gotta try the port wine out there, you know? And I'm like, my boss is telling me to go have port wine on his dime, you know? Just knew how to, you know, he wasn't saying, hey, go out and get sloshed. He was saying, you know, he, he was, he was he, you know, we were, we were a team. And now it's very corporate very, you know, by the book and different, you know, food in, 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 in coach was cut, you know, a lot of those uh, different things, you know, now it's the, the, the program now with the, with the points, it's crazy for us. It's nuts because everybody's like looking on their phone, like, am I the next one to get upgraded? You know, United created this thing called uh, uh, basic economy which is basically no bags whatsoever. So people don't, they don't understand that there means no bags. It's like you just your little bag that you can put under the seat in front of you and that's it. While other airlines are taking things away, Continental still offers things like pillows, blankets, and meals at mealtime. Yeah, Continental, work hard, fly right. I love Continental. I mean, I, I, I can sit here all day and tell you positives of Continental. So why did other airlines start to take stuff away? I tell you, it, it became very, like, numbers, you know, numbers. And I think that that also changes the way the employees act changes the way the employees act, that means it changes the way the employees act towards the customers, the way the, the customer sees the, the, the company. I don't know, man, I, I really don't know. Do you remember the, uh, the safety instruction? No. <laughs> I was not the one reading it ever, because I was never the boss. I didn't want to be the boss. You know, of course, this is doesn't take rocket science, you know, it's just, of course, now I can't get it open. It was all fun and games till you have an emergency, and then you realize this could happen any day, any time. You sit in your jump seat and you think of your commands that you have to say. You know, unfasten seatbelts, come this way, don't take anything with you, remove your shoes, jump, jump, jump. You know, I still say it, you know, in my dreams. Safety, though, has always been one of the main reasons why we are on that airplane, is to take care of passages in case of an emergency and make sure that they can get out and that they're taken care of. There's an evacuation. Do you know what to do? You don't know what to do. And while that safety video was going on, you were talking with the guy next to you. I'm there to save your ass, not serve your ass. I don't know that I would put it in quite the same terms as a, a colleague, but um, yeah, our primary reason for being there is for safety. We're trained. We know how to get you off the airplane. We're trained in, in all kinds of uh, you know medical uh, things. If you're having a heart attack, you know CPR, 
the defibrillator. We know how to use these things. I had medical emergencies where I had to give people oxygen and I had to do mouth to mouth on people. I had to give continuous oxygen to somebody for four or five hours and I had to operate all the uh, the oxygen tanks which are hard to operate into and then when they get exhausted then you have to refill them. Then I had another guy who passed out and I had to get him out of his seat, lay him down on the ground. I did mouth to mouth on him. Turned out he had the flu. <laughs> Wonderful. They got dressed up to fly, and um, they were all in a good mood because they were going from New York to California, and they were on vacation, and they were happy, and they all wanted a cocktail. But then after 9-11, it was not about service anymore. It was about safety and security. I don't care who you are. I don't care what's going on with you. I don't care what vacation you're on. You have to listen to the flight attendant and obey the rules. It was a special thing you know, going to the airport or going on a flight. Um, and so they would get in their Sunday best because they were going to go, they were going to have a nice flight, they were going to have a nice meal on board the aircraft. Passengers in the 90s may have been a little bit more laid back. Today you have to deal with so much more. You deal with the security along security lines, you deal with, you know, delays more so than I think back then because there weren't as many flights going on. So I think passengers today, you know, it's get very frustrated at times when, when so maybe the airplanes, you know, break down or something happens. You know, everybody started complaining about everything. And the company would kind of like, si you know, I guess not to hear them or to, to silence them or whatever. They would, they would um, side with them and, and give them things. So you would complain and you were basically rewarded for bad behavior. There's a rule. It's basically you can't interfere with crew member instructions, you know. Um, Basically, if a crew member tells you to do something, you have to follow directions. Uh, but it's nowadays, it's, I mean, after COVID, that whole thing with the masks, there was, there's fights constantly on, on airplanes. Uh, we would tell people to wear a mask and no, no. So it's like, what do you do? You tell them again, you know, hopefully they put the mask on. I had names called, you know, so many names called at me right after during that, that mask period. Um, you know, I would tell people, hey, you need to put your mask on. You know, F you, I don't got to do nothing. You know, you, I'm not doing what you tell me. I'm like, actually, you have to do it, I tell you, because that's the rule. But that's what I'm saying. It's like the company were taking the sides. After a while, they were like taking the sides of the, of the passengers. And I'm like, well, it's a, different, it's a different world flying today than when I was flying. I think there's a, a distinct lack of respect for people who are in positions of authority, which is your flight crew on board the aircraft. And it's kind of sad. Um, you know, did we ever have people who were um, acting up on flights? Yeah, sure. But in general, that was rare. And today it seems to be almost a norm that there is an expectation if you're not happy with something that one, you don't have to listen to this crew member and two, you can demand or insist or take matters into your own hands, which is very dangerous. We want to calm the uh, environment up there, man. You, you're at 38,000 feet uh, flying. When I say flying, I mean flying. You're going fast. And there's no, there's no like, let's stop really quick and, you know, let's pause this. No, you're, you know, you got to make sure everything is cool. They don't respect the flight attendants today. And I heard a, f a flight attendant getting her teeth knocked out a f maybe two years ago because she asked somebody to put their seatbelt on. People had to have money to fly in the old days, and they had to get dressed up. And now, with the cheaper fares, you're getting people who don't understand what it's like to fly. And it's not easy to fly now. You have to make sure you don't drink a lot of coffee because you can't be getting up to go to the bathroom constantly. You have to make sure that you bring your own food because it's not guaranteed that it's going to be food on your flight. And what if you have a delay? You have to bring snacks. You have to bring something to entertain yourself. You have to bring your headphones. You don't need us today as much as you did for service. You don't need us to do all the service, but you still need us for safety. So, you know, we had a change in ownership. We had uh, Robert Crandall for a long time. He was tough, but he didn't take the money and put it in his pocket. He made he put the money back into the airline. But we had um, Doug Parker, who came from America West, 
who came from US Air and they took over as managers and they're not used to running a legacy carrier. And they had all these ideas. They were like a bunch of college frat boys. They didn't really see the big picture that Crandall did. Why would you ever take the screens out of the seat backs? It makes them so happy, the customers. They're so happy. They want to watch a TV show. They want to watch a movie. They're quiet. They're happy the whole flight. When they have nothing, they, have, they get more aggravated about little things. Oh, I've always been service oriented, so I just wish that we had more to offer the passengers, especially in the economy. You know, sometimes we'll have a, a longer flight and, you know, and now we're offering a little bit more snacks in the back and then we have snacks for purchase. It's hard, especially in the morning or if you're just getting a, a drink and, you know, and maybe just a little biscuit or something. It's just, to me, it's not enough. It's not, it's totally different. I come I come from a, a, a generation of, of flight attendants, you know. You can say, you know, I, I say pre-September 11th. But there's people that now, new kids, you know, they say pre-COVID, you know, everything's changed. Every, every time there's a situation, you know, things get implemented in that, that just takes the fun out of that. Stories that I heard from from past, uh, from senior flight attendants, I'm 25 years. I was flying with 40-year flight attendants. You know, hearing their stories, whoa. They're like, yeah, we used to carve the roast and you know we had the roast in the, in the middle of the aisle and, and real silverware and you know, it's, it's, you know beautiful like great great things you know now it's it's like it turned into a bus it's a commute